So good. All right. The story is titled, I'm never online dating again. <sighs> After a long streak of bad luck with women, yesterday I decided I'd take my friend Tom's code name, advice, and make an online dating profile. I searched all the different options, Match.com, Zeusk, etc. Since Tom was having luck with OkCupid, I figured I'd give it a go. I filled out all the fields, the about section and interests, which Tom helped me with. Apparently, there are some interests that you can put that'll get you more hits that aren't necessarily a big deal when you meet face to face. A match because I like the outdoors was fine with me. I liked it enough, I guess, as long as it got me laid. I let the profile sit for a night and figured I'd check it after I got off shift today. After I got off work, I have to admit I was excited. It was a streamlined way to meet women without all the hassle of going to a bar or having an empty conversation, only to realize it was going nowhere. I rubbed my hands together and opened OkCupid okay on my phone. There were multiple hits, but one stuck out among the rest. Thank you, Jeff. She was gorgeous, green eyes, slight freckles on her, check, on her cheeks, and dark red hair. I wasn't normally into redheads, but I'm a sucker for eyes. I got lost in her eyes a few moments before I felt a hand clasp my shoulder. Any luck? Tom had already pulled out his phone and began to swipe furiously on Tinder. I showed him the picture of the girl and he let, a, he let out a long, soft whistle. Looks like she's a match, dude. Jump on that before someone else does. <laughs> Shut up, Leonic. I nodded and opened up her message. Her name was Aubrey. Her message was something like, Hey cutie, I saw your profile and I liked what I saw. If you want to chat, I'm free tonight. XD? No, XO. XO. The blood rushed to my face. After so much trial and error, something had finally worked. The power of the internet. I sent her a quick message telling her I'd be online in an hour or so, and headed home in Tom's black Honda Accord. He kept busting my balls the whole ride home. Don't stall on this, he said. I convinced him I'd follow through. The whole internet dating thing was new to me, but Tom had been hooking up frequently using it, so I was all for it. It was better than nothing. When I got home, I took a shower, then got dressed, and sat down at my desk. I sent her a message saying I was online. It was dumb of me to do. You're seeming desperate, I told myself. I was surprised when a message popped up only a few minutes later. She said she was into all of the stuff I was into, which was awesome. But some of that was conjured up by my friend. I felt guilty and confessed about it. She apparently had also made up the exact same stuff. We laughed about it, and we talked for a while. There were unreal similarities in our taste. I told her I actually liked the movie Goiver, an American adaptation to the Japanese anime. Aubrey did too, and cited scenes that she enjoyed the most. We hated and loved the same foods. She watched the same shows, and we both loved The Office and Game of Thrones. She played the same PC games, and she spoke about them to the point that I knew she, wa she just wasn't blowing smoke. I felt like I was on cloud nine. Maybe she would be more than a hookup. I smirked through the entire conversation that lasted a couple of hours. Welcome back, Cardu. At around 7 p.m. when I got the message I had been silently praying for, how about we skip the BS and you come to my place an hour, to, an hour from now? Sound good. So, eight? I replied. 
Sounds good. I'll see you soon. Uh, happy emoji. Here's my address. Eight did seem like an odd hour to start a meetup, but we had already discussed how we were both night owls and played video games into the wee hours of the morning, so it didn't strike me as alarming. I asked to borrow Tom's car, and he forked over the keys. He gave me a courtesy pat on the ass and shouted, Hopefully she's not a troll in real life. Hopefully. That's not funny, dick. Duck. I slammed the door behind me. I plugged in the GPS that had been coiled inside the dashboard and plotted my destination. After doing a quick smell check, I headed out to meet Aubrey. After a while, the nicer houses were replaced by run-down apartment complexes and boarded-up businesses. There were shadows moving between parked cars and stoops with hooded men staring at me as I drove by. I tightened my grip on the, on the steering wheel and gulped. After several minutes fearing for my life, the GPS chirped that I would arrive at the destination on left. I looked up and saw an apartment complex in dire need of upkeep. The brick walls were covered in, a dec in decades of dirt and grime, and some of the windows on the first floor were boarded up. I parked the car in a small lot in between complexes and made sure all Tom's valuables were hidden away under the seat. I adjusted my collar and headed inside. The drywall inside and spots of brick had rotted away and collapsed into dust on the floor. After living a while in the city, this is not a rare occurrence. Things were falling apart in every corner of the metropolis. I wrote her information on my hand already, and I glanced at my palm for reference. She was on the second floor, apartment 30. I made my way up the stairs and headed down the hallway. There were echoes of babies crying, families screaming at one another in Spanish, and someone playing Letterman way too loud. Finally, I found her door. I breathed deep and knocked. What's up, not nap? She opened the door. A waft of flowery fragrance hit me in the face. I blinked twice and saw her standing there. She was beautiful, just as she had advertised. She wore a silk pajama outfit and had red hair balled up in a bun. Hey, concrete circus. She smiled wide and revealed her perfectly white teeth. Hey, Aubrey. Nice to meet you. She wrapped me in a hug and brought me inside her apartment. It's almost like I've known her forever after a talk earlier. Is that weird? She guided me to the couch and we sat down next to each other. I didn't think... What she said was weird at all. I felt entranced and intrigued by her, and I wanted to get to know her. She was a solid 8 out of 10, an absolute bombshell. 33%. No, that's not weird. I think we should go out and stuff, you know? She laughed and stood up. Yeah, maybe. I got something else for you tonight, though. It's special. She winked at me and disappeared into her kitchen. The apartment was what I considered underfurnished. She had a wooden coffee table in the center of her living room, and the couch I was sitting on. And the couch I was sitting on. No TV, no computer desk, at least that I could see anyway. I shrugged it off, convincing myself that all her belongings were in her room. I did the same thing, keeping my computer in my room. That was normal. I heard pots and pans clinking together in the kitchen. I raised my voice to get her attention. I've already eaten, so there's no need. Oh, it, no, it's nothing. Just putting away some dishes. I'll be right there. We had talked about games earlier, so I'd fi I, I figured I'd break the silence with some more conversation. You said you were diamond in league, huh? <laughs> That's pretty impressive for a girl. I was... Just talking about your diamond, she cocked her head and raised her brow. Wait, wait, what? She appeared in the dory. What are you talking about? I was just talking about your diamond, she cocked her head and raised her brow. 
Your rank in League of Legends, Diamond. That's what you said. Aubrey laughed with a wheeze. Oh, right, yeah, League of Legends, Diamond. She sat down to me <laughs> and kept a smile on her face. Uh-oh, double dip delish. Uh-oh, man. It struck me as odd that she didn't know what I had been talking about. I expected to sit... I expected her to start sprouting off game ideas and her most recent matchups. There wasn't any of that. I decided to press her ear about things that we had talked about earlier. You said you like to watch TV. I don't see one. Do you Hulu or something? I asked. What's a Hulu? No, I have a TV. I get basic cable. How do you watch Game of Thrones? It's on HBO. I rented it. Rented it from where? iTunes? Blockbuster. Blockbuster? I blinked hard. I hadn't seen a Blockbuster in years. The last one my block was growing up was replaced by a Starbucks years ago. <laughs> she stood up and walked back towards the kitchen. You look tense. I'm gonna get a drink. Do you want something? N no, I'm okay. I started letting my mind wander. Who was she? Everything so far, other than her appearance, seemed to be fake. I started to inspect her living room closely, my eyes fixed on a dark oval-shaped spot near her coffee table. While hearing her opening and closing cupboards in the adjacent room, I nudged away the table with my foot. The spot was red, and it was old. The threads of the carpet were matted to the floor. I'm actually getting scared, guys. I'm starting to get scared. I I don't fucking want to do this. Oh god. Well, here we go. Let's continue. Fuck. Neko, you should write not nap into your story. I noticed a subtle trail of red that had glazed the top of the carpet and disappeared at the entrance of the kitchen. Before I could inspect more, she appeared again with two white mugs. She placed a mug in front of me on the table and took her own in both hands. I figured I'd give you something to take the edge off. Bourbon is my favorite. What's going on here? Why are you acting all weird? I stood up and shuffled towards the door. She intercepted me and raised her hand to my chest. We locked eyes. I crossed my arms. Things were getting creepy. No, never mind, never mind, sorry. She shook her head and tucked her chin. I'm sorry, it was a long work day. I've got a lot of things on my mind. And you're just so great. I don't want to ruin it. She pointed to the couch. Please sit. I promise. I won't bite. I crossed my arms. Things were creepy. But she seemed legitimate. I never really wanted to hurt a girl's feelings. In my mind, I started to conjure reasons why things I had heard and seen were just circumstantial. The red stain was probably wine, and her answers earlier were probably because she had been drinking already. No big deal. I walked over and sat down, and she did the same. Aubrey scooted closer and put a hand on my leg. Let's have a toast, shall we? She raised her mug. I said I wasn't thirsty. I pushed forward towards the opposite edge of the coffee table. Nabroar, thanks for the follow, man, and welcome to the stream. Enjoy yourself, and you can be a big pig, too. Um, I hope you're enjoying the story. I said I wasn't thirsty. I pushed further towards the opposite edge of the coffee table. Things got quiet as we stared at each other. She looked at me, and her face wrinkled. If we're going to be together, you need to do this. She pushed the mug towards me. Drink. Whoa, whoa, who said anything about being together? Something tells me this isn't just a long day at work, lady. I got up and headed towards the door. I did have a long day at work. I'm tired, concrete circus. Oh, yeah? When we talked earlier, you said you were off today. I moved to the door and grabbed the doorknob. Her expression changed. She had been caught in a lie. Aubrey's face shifted into a tightness that seemed unnatural. She reached behind her back slowly. I felt an immediate sense of danger, uh, an immediate sense of danger and fear gripped me in place. 
That's it, guys. Stream's fucking over. All right. <laughs> See you later. Fuck. <laughs> guys, I don't want to do this. I don't want to fucking do this. I don't want to fucking do this. She's got a chopstick. All right, fuck. Please don't make the stories too, too scary, okay? Not too scary. Not too scary. All right, here we go. Time for us to go. You got it, Neko. That's it. I got to finish this for Rosalina. I got to finish this for Rosalina. Thank you for the follow, not Jen. Welcome to the stream. Enjoy yourself, and you can be a big, big too. Thank you very much. We're running out of water. It wasn't supposed to be like this. We're going to be together. We have to be together. Her voice came out low and throaty, like someone who was choking. When she went to stand up, with her hands still behind her back, I threw the door open and ran as fast as I could. I almost tumbled down the flight of stairs, leading to the exit. As I left, I looked behind me to make sure she didn't follow. I accidentally shoulder-checked a middle-aged Arab, Arab man. He cursed at me and pointed his finger. What's the matter with you? Are you causing trouble in my building? I saw you run out fast like you were doing no good. I'll call the cops. I don't care how white you are. What did you steal? Good night, Ram. Good night, Ram. Leonic, this is fucking killing me, man. What's up, Jonesta? Welcome back. Even though he had tried to stab me with racial slurs, I decided to talk to him. He said it was his building. The chicken apartment 30 is fucking crazy. I think she tried to kill me. He cocked his head. You didn't steal anything? You're high. That's it. Get out of my way, junkie. Dude, I was just almost killed in your building. Why don't you give a shit? Oh, really? Killed by someone in apartment 30? That's impossible. It's been condemned for years. A woman killed herself in there. Now fuck off, asshole. I don't want to read this. I don't want to read this. My heart sank. I didn't know what to think. What was her name, the woman in apartment 30? Ashley or Angel? Something? Aubrey. I swallowed hard. Sounds right. He pulled up the collar on his jacket and looked over his shoulders. He seemed a bit rattled by my questions, and rightfully so. Leave me alone before I call the police. I turned my back and ran to the car. I kept looking over my shoulders and through the windows as I started up the car. Like, I have the... Something's fucking behind me, guys. I have this terrible feeling. I'm gonna die. <laughs> I kept looking over my shoulders through the windows as I started up the car. Double dip delish. Thanks for the follow, man. Welcome to the stream. Enjoy yourself. And you can be a big pig too. I peeled out of the parking lot and onto the two lane road. When I got back to the apartment, I told Tom everything. He laughed for most of it, like I had made it up to disguise me chickening out. Chickening out. I pulled up OkCupid on my phone to show him the address that I had gone to. He knew the layout of the city, and he didn't believe me when I said she was living in the ghetto. Don't do it, Jonesta. Yeah, not now. If I trust you, man, you'll save me. Her profile was gone, along with all her messages. No trace of her. I searched for a few minutes, scrolling up and down frantically on my phone I, I like I need someone fucking here with me right now okay I need someone here with me 
because I'm dying tonight, okay? This is on you guys. This is on fucking you guys. Fuck. Tom sighed and patted my back. Sure, Concrete Circus, I believe you. Is that what you want to hear? Go to sleep, man. We both have work at like nine or so. I pocketed my phone and nodded. I took a long hot shower and tried to forget everything that happened. Try to maybe write it off as some type of weird hallucination. I heard my phone beep and vibrate while I dried off. I picked it up and looked at it and there was some, and Okay. Okay. I heard my phone beep and vibrate while I dried off. I picked it up and looked at it and looked at the received message. You can't run, Concrete Circus. We were meant to be. You'll see. I swiped the screen and searched my message box. Fucking shit, man. Are you fucking kidding me right now? Don't stop. Oh my fucking god. Jesus Christ. Oh my fucking god. Alright, Jonesta. Thanks for the donation, man. Thank you very much for the donation. Shut up, Leonic. Ah, this is why I don't do horror shit, okay? Thank you very much for the $5 donation. Thank you very much. <laughs> Fuck. I might just take my earphones out, okay? <laughs> I swiped the screen and searched my message box, but the message had vanished. No trace for it. I can't sleep. And I fear for my life. I don't know what's happening, and so far Tom didn't believe me. I doubt anyone else will listen to the story about a ghost I met on OkCupid. This is really the one place I can go anonymously and tell my story. I'll keep posting if anything else happens. Tomorrow, I'm going to do some research. Update. I'll post a follow on tonight. There's a lot of weird shit going on. I've only been able to access my internet for the last hour. The rest of the day has been spotty service at best. Oh god. Oh god. Alright, I'm done. I am done. I am done. I am done. Second part. I can click the second part, but I'm gonna die. I'm gonna fucking die, guys. Like, Jesus. Rosalina, you better still be awake for this. You better still be awake. I don't know why we're doing spooky stories. I don't know why we're doing spooky stories. Ugh. I'm I'm gonna need a Skype call. I'm going to need a Skype call after the stream. I'm gonna have to talk to someone, and I'm gonna have to be safe because otherwise I'm gonna I'm gonna die. I'm gonna die. Fuck. This is pretty much a horror game right now. This is a horror game for me. You guys tricked me into it. All right. All right. All right, here we go. Here we go. Fuck. No, I don't want to no, Zoraki's not Skype calling me right now. No, he can he can call me after the stream. I don't trust him with that shit. Nope, that's not how it goes, Leonic. At last, I'm able to post an update. Hold on, I got a Skype message. I would be down. Alright. Jones, come on, man. Come on. Alright, okay. I don't trust you, Zoraki. I don't fucking trust you. 
I need more water, but I can't get more water, guys. I'm scared to fucking leave and go downstairs. I am scared to leave my room, my room, and get downstairs for 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 more water right now. I uh, nope, Zoraki, nope. I am scared to go downstairs for water. This is fucking bullshit. <laughs> this is fucking bullshit. I gotta make this last. I gotta make this water last. <laughs> Alright. My lips are dry. <clears throat> At last, I'm able to post an update. The last day and a half or so have been terrible. First, I told you all I was gonna do some research. Well, I did. It turns out that the deaths in the ghetto, for the most part, have very vague reports that lack detail. Don't fucking do it, Zoraki. Don't you send me that shit. I'm not clicking that that fucking thing, man. Whatever you sent me, Zoraki, I'm not clip I'm not I'm not clicking that shit. I know how you feel, Neko. I know how you feel, and I am so sorry for this. <laughs> well I did. It turns out that the deaths in the ghetto, for the most part, have very vague reports that lack detail. So what was the next best thing? I headed back over to the apartment complex in broad daylight, of course, and asked a few sketchy people outside of the apartment who owns the building, and they told me, last door on the left, he ain't never in there. I walked through the first floor hallway, occasionally stepping over fall- Fucking Leonix, stop it, man! I'm turning that shit off. I am turning that shit off. I am turning that shit off. I am fucking turning that shit off. I am turning that shit off. Thank you for the $25 donation. Jesus fucking Christ. Fucking, that's bullshit. Don't do it. Just don't. Don't do it. <clears throat> fucking shit. I walked through the first floor hallway, occasionally stepping over fallen pieces of ceiling tile and crumbled brick. <laughs> and crumbled brick. The door to his office had five fucking padlocks, like Fort Knox. I had never seen that much security. Two? Definitely three? That's pushing it. I'm so sorry, Neko. Don't, you, you don't have to be here. You don't have to be here, trust me. I know how it feels. You don't have to be here, okay? You don't have to be here. Like, if you need to take the night off, just, you can take the night off. It's, like, I'm having a tough time. I knocked on the door and heard some grunting and shuffling of feet. The door swung open and the same Arab man from the other night peeked from within, rubbing his eyes with his free hand. What do you want? Do you owe? He stopped and scanned my body with wide eyes. I told you to leave. I'm call. No, please. I propped my hands against the door to keep it from shutting in my face. Only after I had done that did I realize how risky of a move that was. You said that. You said there was a girl who died in apartment 30. What do you know about it? His face darkened, and I once again felt pressure trying to push the door closed. It's none of your business. Leave. I tried to come up with something to ease the tension. Anything that would get me informed. She was a friend of the family. Please, I just need some information. I'm writing a story about her life. Oh, crazy Hans. <clears throat> The pressure released on the door, and he stared at me for what seemed like two straight minutes. He let out a low growl. Come in. This better not be bullshit. I walked past him, and he directed me to a fold-out chair in front of his desk. The whole office stunk of onions and kebab. I'm not trying to be racist, but I'm pretty sure he had eaten some kind of seasoned lamb or something before I had arrived. Oh, Jeff, come on. The layout of the office was similar to the hallways outside. All for, all, all for walls, all four walls, 
were missing spots of drywall, revealing the aged boards beyond the paint. There was a radio behind him that was blaring an Arab, an Arab male voice shouting indecipherable jargon. He clicked the radio off and sat down. <laughs> we stared at each other. He folded his hands and leaned against his desk. Before you ask anything, I have to let you know that there is something about the girl that went wrong. I would get noise complaints for her neighbor, from her neighbors all the time. The TV was too loud, or she needed to shut her dog up. Never spoke to anyone. Didn't make eye contact either. I need a break. I need a break. I need a break. I need a break, and I need this thing, this fucking green screen, to be gone from behind me, because it's scaring the shit out of me right now. Neko, it's scaring the shit out of me. All right, let's take a break. Okay, let's just take a quick break. Okay, just... Oh, I wish I had something to eat. I'm so hungry. I'm not stopping this. I'm not stopping this and going downstairs. I am not leaving this chair. I'm not leaving this fucking chair. Now I fucking know why Judge likes this blanket. Now I fucking know why Judge likes his blanket. Shut up, Jonesta. That's not cool, man. What's up, Richard Forty? How you doing, man? How was Fisky's 24-hour stream? Alright. I know. I know. Alright. No, it's too close to me, Jones. The green screen is right, right, very close to me. Okay. That's really good, Richard. That's really good. Good for him, man. All right, guys. I took the information and nodded. What happened? Who found her? One of the neighbors heard her dog growling for hours. They pounded on the door and it opened. She was dead in the middle of the floor, blood everywhere. Her wrists were slit and she carved a nice gash into her neck. Didn't last long, I don't think. I gulped hard. That is quite an awful way to go. I've heard of slit wrists, but gashing your own throat. Why was the apartment con why was the apartment condemned? I mean, you could clean it up, right? We tried. Believe me, I had contractors scrub all scrub day and night. They replaced the carpet. The blood would always come back. I never go up there anymore. It makes me sick to my stomach. He shivered, and a bead of sweat started to accumulate on his greasy forehead. The tenants on that floor... The tenants on that floor I have to catch down here to get their rent. If they stayed in their apartments all day on the second floor, they could live rent-free. I'm never going up there. Come on, Jones. I'm gonna fucking permaban you, man. I'm gonna permaban you. Ah. Oh. Oh. When I heard about the blood, my heart stopped. I had seen it that night under the coffee table. She had hit it, or attempted to at least. I stood up and grabbed the doorknob. Well, I think that's it. I'm d. Please don't come back. Don't try to go up there either. There's nothing to see in that apartment. He raised his hand and stood up so fast his rolling chair hit the wall. Deep within me, I felt his shaky posture and the sweat pooling on his, on his indicated, on him indicated he wasn't telling me everything. I had learned enough though and didn't push any further. I left the apartment and headed home. When I got back to my computer, 
When I got back to my computer desk, I wrote down everything he told me. At around 4 p.m., Tom came home. He was shutting cupboards and drawers hastily, causing a symphony of dull booms to permeate through the wall. Oh, crazy Hans. I came into the common area and saw him throwing on, a ni on nice clothes. I caught him hopping on one leg, trying to pull on his jeans. I coughed to make my presence known. Yeah, Neko, you should go to have a sleepover. Go have a sleepover. Don't be alone. That fucking sound. What is that? What is that sound? What is that sound? Exactly, Neko. Yeah, I know. I know. I know. I'm not sleeping until the, the sun comes up. I'm, I'm honest. I'm not going to sleep until the sun comes up. I, I'm... Yeah, it's 4, 10 a.m. I gotta wait a few more... A few more... <laughs> few more hours I am not sleeping until the Sun comes up <sighs> oh my god <sighs> yeah that's the same one that's the same one I, I like took it out of my ears so I didn't hear the whole thing so I don't know if there's anything else but that was scary. He looked up at me, still hoping. I've been talking to this chick online. I don't know, man. I think she's the real deal. That's hard to find. Know what I mean? You can do it, Neko, okay? We can do it together, me and you, all right? I gotta sit through this. I gotta sit through this, okay? So I'll be here, I'll be here with you. I'll, I'll be, I'll be, I'll be here with you, okay? We can, we can do it together, okay? We're almost there. We're almost there. He looked at me, still hopping. I've been talking to this chick online. I don't know, man. I think she's the real deal. That's hard to find. Know what I mean? Online? What? Some more Tinder crap? He laughed and pulled his pants up to his waist. Look, man. Don't be bitter because you chickened out and some dude already got your girl. Early bird gets the V. I leaned up against the wall and crossed my arms. Where are you meeting up? Her place. She lives downtown. It's super sketchy down there, but I've walked that road before. It's no sweat. I became uneasy at the thought of him going to a chick's place to meet after what I had experienced. I think you should meet her somewhere in public. What happened to me is real, dude. Trust me. Don't do it. We argued for a good five minutes. He finally agreed. He pulled up the girl's okay cupid profile to send her a message, and my and my blood ran ice cold. It was her. Aubrey, except it wasn't. She didn't have red hair anymore, but in the new picture, she had a darker complexion and brown hair. Her eye color wasn't green anymore, it was hazel. I slapped the phone out of his hand. Oh. He pushed my shoulder and bent over to pick it up. What the fuck was that for? Do you know how much these iPhone 5s cost, dickhead? Dude, that's her. That's the chick I met the other night. Is it? Well, look like, looks like she's acquired a better palette. Dude, I'm fucking serious. That's her. She changed her look. I locked the two deadbolts on the door and stood in front of it. In front of him. You're not going. I'll knock you out before I let you go. He raised his hands in defeat. Okay, okay. Fine, dude. You can have her. It's not that serious. She's just a lay. I walked back to my room and Microsoft Word was up. I moved closer to read the screen. Jealous? 
you were in the building and you didn't even pay a visit. It seemed like almost simultaneously my internet began to crap out and my once three bars of cell phone service dropped to no service. This happened almost all day yesterday. Hence the late response. I decided I would stay in and catch up on some shows. I had just started to watch Parks and Rec and there were a few Walking Dead episodes I missed. Yes, it's not good anymore, but it's my thing. Needless to say, I was looking over my shoulder and checking closets for the duration of the night. At around 7 or 8, the apartment door slammed shut. My heart was racing, and my hands shook so much that I couldn't even close my laptop. I moved to my bedroom door. Tom's room, Tom's room light was off, and his door was wide open. I got that sickening feeling again, like, you know, like when you know something was up. I tried to text him, but the service was still out. I moved to the door and undid the locks. The door didn't budge. I tried pulling with my foot against the door frame. I had this fight or flight instinct, and all I could think about doing was running. After a minute, the door finally opened wide. I fell over. I scrambled to my feet and headed down the stairs. This is gonna get loud. This is gonna get loud. I scrambled to my feet and headed down the stairs and out of the building. My service returned and I texted Tom. Just a quick, hey dude, where you at? No response. I hurried to the parking garage and speed walked to my truck. Tom's was better on gas, which is why we always took that one to work every day. My Toyota was a fucking gas fiend. I put my phone on the passenger seat and started it. The phone lit up and I picked it up. An unnamed message popped up. I'll take care of your friend. He seems nice. Fuck. The top <laughs> Zeraki. <laughs> oh, don't do it, Neko. No, Neko. No, 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 no. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it in the transition. I mean, you want to be fast, but trust me, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. I swiped to reply, and the message had vanished again. I pulled out and hauled ass down the road. There's only a few things more terrifying than driving a Toyota Tundra down a street that you know is going to have people running back and forth across traffic and people suddenly pulling out their parking spots. I arrived and parked at the apartment, building and ran inside. There were a lot more mentally thi there there are a lot of, there are a lot of things mentally that were trying to keep me from heading up to that apartment. But I had to make sure Tom didn't do anything stupid. <laughs> no, Cardu. No, Cardu. No, Cardu. Don't do it, Neko. You're gonna die. Don't jump out the window. What are you doing? I ran down the second floor hallway and got to her apartment, number 30. I put my ear up to the door. I heard growling, like a large dog. It wasn't friendly by any means. There's some growls that are warnings and others that sound more throaty fucking shit. And done. 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 Done.
Don't be mean to Neko. Comfort Neko, all right, guys? Comfort Neko. Don't just fucking be mean to Neko. You guys comfort Neko, okay? Make her feel better. What are you doing? What are you doing? I mean, I'm not Neko, so it's fine for me, but you comfort Neko. Don't you be a bad chat, okay? You guys be good. I need a little break, okay? I need to pretend to drink some water. That's empty as fuck. Because I need something. I need something. My back's tightening up. Alright, you guys encourage Neko. You know, help her make it through this. Help her make her through this, Soraki. Especially you and Cardu, okay? Especially you and Cardu. Neko, I don't know if you should click that link. I know, Samska, I know. More throaty, like they're getting ready to pounce. I put a shoulder to the door and forced my way in. Tom was sit Tom sat on, on the couch, staring at the wall. The layout was different than before. It was covered in cobwebs and dust, and all the furniture had silvers had sil had slivers of wood and hunks of foam missing. There were symbols everywhere, red letters and shapes. It blended together, and the sloppy lines crisscrossed one another. The red stain was still there in the center of the carpet. I grabbed Tom under the arm and tugged him off the couch. He resisted and opened his eyes groggily. She's making drinks. We're having a good time. He tried to make he tried to break my grip. Lay off. I pulled with all my might and got him outside the apartment. We were halfway down the hall when a loud, when a loud female scream filled the air. By the time we were at the stairs, some tenants poked their heads outside to see what was going on. I shook the sense back into Tom once we were back on the sidewalk outside. What the fuck is the matter with you? Didn't I tell you not to go in there? She's cool, man. You missed out, Tom smirked. She's not real, man. She's someone else. If we'd go up there, you'd see her apartment is all fucked up. I don't care if she doesn't have a TV or a computer. She's old-fashioned. It's kind of attractive. Idiot. I grabbed his shoulder and pulled him down the road. I'm driving you home. I'll move you out and you'll be stuck with 3,000... I'll move out and you'll be stuck with 3,000... 3,000 gr 3, grand a month. <laughs> 3,000 grand a month rent by yourself if you pull that shit again. Fucking 3,000 grand, man. Whatever. We got back and we parted ways. He went to, into his room and I went to mine. Tom slammed the door b behind him. The internet service was back, finally. At 11 last night, I could call and fully download the show episodes that had been crawling towards 100% earlier. I figured I'd download some and go to bed since I'd be up, I had to be up early. I took a shower, and that's when it started to get weirder. Nope. 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 At one point in the shower, I had gotten soap in both eyes. I was washing them when I heard a low rumbling growl just outside of the curtain. I screamed like a girl, I have to be honest, and pulled the curtains open, ready to strike with my bottle of Old Spice body wash. Nothing was there. The door had still been closed. I dried off and went to bed. The whole night I woke up several times in cold sweats. When I woke up, I had finished breakfast, mussed up, and Tom was still in his room. I opened the door and turned on the light. He scared the fuck out of me when I found him sitting up in his bed, Indian style. I checked my watch. Dude, we've got like 45 minutes to get to work. He stared into space. Yeah, I'm almost ready. I checked my watch. I pounded the wall. Tom, wake the fuck up, we've got to go. He shook his head and slipped his legs over the side of the bed. Yeah, sorry, dude. The ride to work was silent. And when we got to work, we parted ways to our different departments, like we normally do. 
We just got home about an hour or so ago. That's it. That's the story. That's it. There's no more. That's it. That's fucking it. That's that's it. That's it. That that's it. That's, yeah, that's all of it. There's no part three yet. Oh, the new girl, part three? Wait, hold on. No, this is I'm Never Online Dating Again, part two. Reddit, no sleep. Why would you send me this? Rosalina, are you still here? Oh, I'm not reading that, Jeff. I'm not fucking reading that shit. Zeraki, I'm not clicking with you. What you sent me. I don't think there's more. I don't think there's more. It kinda... Is that it, guys? Did I even type to Neko? Why is or not Neko? Uh, Rosalina. I cannot believe you guys got me to do this. You guys like ease me into this some somehow. I don't know, Samska. I don't know. No, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not reading that, Jeff. I, I'm not reading that blipsqueak. I'm not reading that, man. I'm not reading that, but I feel like this is an incomplete story. Like we have to do more. I'm. I don't. I, I, can we just read a nice story? Just a nice bedtime story. Can someone link me a nice bedtime story? We so we can, so we can just kind of finish the stream, and I can, I can go and, fucking, cry. Same one. Hurry. Do an ending. Um. Okay. Uh, it turns out fucking Tom just had really bad case of half a lumps and it was making him delirious and f for me it was my ex-girlfriend playing a really really good trick on me because she was really mad at me and she really wanted revenge but then you know I found a new girl and we got married and everybody lived happily ever after okay that's it that's it my, oh god, Zomnipotent. I did say I would do yours. Zomni, or your story is... I have no mouth and I must scream? I'm not doing that. I'm not reading that. Nope. 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 Not reading that shit. Not reading that shit. No, I'm not doing it, Zomni. I'm not reading that shit. I just... I, I am not reading that shit. Oh, guys. This one isn't scary. Okay. Okay. Zomni, I'm not reading that shit. That's fucking terrifying. That is terrifying. Even that title is terrifying. Oh, fun guy. All right. All right. We're going to we're going to I mean, do you guys really want me to read that story? I have no mouth and I must scream. Cause that's that's a lot. That is too much, honestly. That is too fucking much. 
Let me read this story and you guys can decide, okay? What is it I just got here? This is basically scary stream, scary stories, fun guy. Thank you for the follow, by the way. Um, you can be a big pig too. Okay. He's a big pig. Yup, yup. You can be a big pig too. Ah! Fun guy one on one is cool. Thank you for the follow. Welcome to the stream. Enjoy yourself, and you can be a big pig too. Um, okay. You guys, you can screen that for me, okay? Screen that for me. And I might read it, okay? If Cardu says it's okay, if Zoraki says it's okay, if Neko says it's okay, screen it for me and I might read it, okay? Okay, let's read the nice bedtime story to give us a little bit of a break. Sweet dreams. Once upon a time, there was a mama turtle and a papa turtle who had a little daughter turtle. The mama and papa loved their little daughter turtle very much and they were always happy together. But misfortune struck. Little daughter turtle couldn't get to sleep at night. Every night at bedtime, mom and papa turtle would make a nice comfy bed under a bush by the lake, and the best, pa and the best place in that bed was one for little daughter turtle. Little daughter turtle would lie awake for a long time with her eyes wide open, and when mom and papa turtle closed their eyes and hid their little heads inside their shell houses, she would get up and walk around the lake. She would walk and walk, she really wanted to go to sleep, but she was afraid to even close her eyes because she had terrible dreams. All right, I will, Neko. What's up, Heisenbergler? Great name, man. Soon Mama and Papa Turtle noticed that their little daughter Turtle was growing thinner by the day and that she did not feel well and had a bad appetite. She even began to walk slower than the other turtles. So Mama and Papa decided to go see the wise old turtle. Bring me your little daughter, turtle, said the wise old turtle, and I will have a little chat with her. So Mama and Papa Turtle brought their little daughter turtle to the wise old turtle. What's the matter with you? The wise old turtle asked the little daughter turtle. Why are you so sad? Why do you look so tired? I can't sleep at night at all, answered the little daughter turtle. Why is that? asked the wise old turtle. I'm afraid to go to sleep because I have terrible dreams, said the little daughter turtle sadly. And whose dreams do you see? asked the wise old turtle. I see my own dreams, of course, said the little daughter turtle. If they are your own dreams, then make them good and sweet. But I don't know how to do that, said the little daughter turtle. Here's what you do, said the wise old turtle. As soon as you have a bad dream, wake up and tell it to your mama. All right, I think that's it. I think that's it. That made me feel a little bit better. That did make me feel a little bit better. And then we'll 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 read Neko's as well. All right, Neko. It's still a, a little scary, but mostly fun. Fuck. <laughs> funny to you guys? Is fucking funny? I hope it's fucking funny. Fuck you guys, man. Hi, criminal. Fucking save me, man. Jesus. All right, criminal, you have to judge. Someone judge, uh, you know, I'm just, I'm just saying no. Only nice stories for the rest of the night. I am so done. I am so done. Kelsey, where's your fucking music? God damn it. Oh, fuck. No, that wasn't funny. Exactly, Neko. That was not funny. That was not funny. <laughs> That was not fucking funny. That was not fucking, that was not fucking funny. No, no, uh, -uh. no, -uh. not good. Not fucking good. No, 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 no. 
Oh my god, Zomnipotent. All right. You know what? He did wait all night. You did. And I, okay. I am never doing a horror story after this unless it's for some incentive. So this is it, Zomni. No, I'll read your story, Neko. I'll read your story last, okay? Because it's supposed to help me feel better about myself and living life. Like, my hands are actually just fucking shaking. Um, okay. All right, we have Neko's story loaded up. We'll read the fucking Zomnipotent story. Okay, Zomni, you fucking owe me for this shit, okay? This isn't something I take lightly, okay? I don't do this for a lot of people, so you're getting a free favor here. All right, Zomni. Okay, Zomni. <laughs> oh. 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 All right, let's do it. Let's get this music playing again. I have no mouth and I must scream. Limp, the body of Gorister hung from the pink pallet unsupported hanging high above us in the computer in the computer chamber and it did not shiver in the chill oily breeze that blew eternally through the main cavern the bo the body hung head down attached to the underside of the pallet by the sole of its right foot it had been drained of blood through a precise incision made from ear to ear under the lantern jaw. There was no blood on the reflective surface of the metal floor. Neko, I, I, you shouldn't listen to this. Neko, just mute for a while. Okay, when I do this, five, four, three, two, one, zero. That means you can come back. Okay, that means the story is over. Okay, don't, don't do it, Neko. Just trust me, you don't have to do this. Don't do it. When Gorister joined our group and looked up at himself, it was already too late for us, re for us to realize that. Once again, AM had duped us. Had its fun. It had, it had been a diversion on the part of the machine. Three of us had vomited, turned away from one another in reflex, as ancient as the nausea that had produced it. Only read a paragraph or two? What are you talking about, Zoraki? Should I not read this? <sighs> Gorster went white. It was almost as though he had seen a voodoo icon and was afraid of the furniture. Oh God, he mumbled and walked away. The three of us followed him after a time and found him sitting with his back to one of the smaller chittering banks his head in his hands ellen knelt down beside him and stroked his hair he didn't move but his voice came out of his quivering face clearly why doesn't it just do us in and get it over with christ i don't know how much longer i can go on like this it was our 109th year in the computer he was speaking for all of us All right, Neko. What is that symbol right there? I don't fucking know. There's like a symbol right there. I don't know what it is. Thank you, Dark Lord. I appreciate that, man. Nimdok, which was the name of the machine, which was the name the machine had forced him to use because AM amuses itself with strange sounds, was hallucinating that there were canned goods in the ice caverns. Gorster and I were very dubious. It's another shuck, I told them, like the goddamn frozen elephant AM sold us. Benny almost went out of his mind over that one. We'll hike all the way and it'll be putrefied or some damn thing. I say forget it. Stay here. It'll have to come up with something pretty soon or we'll die. Benny shrugged. Three days it had been since we'd last eaten. Worms, thick, ropey. Mm. 
Nimdok was no more certain. He knew there was a he knew there was a chance, but he was getting thin. It couldn't be any worse there than here. Colder, but that didn't matter much. Hot, cold, hail, lava, boils, or locusts. It never mattered. The machine masturbated, and we had to take it or die. Ellen decided us. I've got to have something, Ted. Maybe there'll be some barley or peaches or pears. Please, Ted, let's try it. Oh, it definitely include Blipsqueak, yeah. Include Blipsqueak and in include Elaine as well, Neko. And Leonic, I think. And Zoraki. Try and include as many people as you can. I gave an easily. What the hell? Mattered not at all. Ellen was grateful though. She look, She took me twice out of turn. Even that had ceased to matter, and she never came. So why bother? Why bother? But the machine giggled every time we did it. Loud up there, back there, all around us, he snickered. It snickered. Most of the time, I thought of AM as it, without a soul. But the rest of the time, I thought of it as him in the masculine, the paternal, the patriarchal, for he is jealous, for he is a jealous people, him, it, God as daddy, the deranged. We left on Thursday. The machine always kept us up to date on the date. The passage of time was important, not to us, sure as hell, but to hit, but to him, it, AM, Thursday. Thanks. Nimdok and Gorstard Nimdok and Gorstard carried Ellen for a while, their hands locked to their own, and each other's wrists a seat. Benny and I walked before and after, just to make sure that if anything happened, it would catch one of us and at least Ellen would be safe. Fat chance safe didn't matter. It was only a hundred miles or so to the ice caverns, and the second day when we were lying out under the blistering sun thing he had materialized, he set down some manna, tasted like, tasted like boiled boar urine. We ate it. Welcome back, Zomni Killer. On the third day, we passed through a valley of obsolescence filled with rustling carcasses of ancient computer banks am had been as ruthless with his own life as with ours it was a mark of his personality it strove for perfection whether it was a matter of killing off unproductive elements in his old world filling bulk or perfecting methods for torturing us am was as thorough as those who had invented him now long gone to dust could ever have hoped. Welcome back, fungi. There was light filtering down from above, and we realized we must be very near to the surface, but we didn't try to crawl up to see. There was virtually nothing out there, had been nothing that could be considered anything for a hundred years. Only the blasted skin of what he, of what had once been the home of billions. Now were the now there were only five of us down here alone with AM. I heard Ellen saying frantically, "No, Benny, don't come on," or "No, Benny, don't come on, Benny, don't please." And then I realized I had been hearing Benny murmuring under his breath for several minutes. He was saying, I'm going to get out. I'm going to get out. Over and over, his monkey-like face was crumbled up in an expression of beatific delight and sadness. All at the same time, the radiation scars AM had given him during the festival 
in quotes, were drawn down onto massive pink white puckerings, and his features seemed to work independently of one another. Perhaps Benny was the luckiest of the five of us. He had gone stark, staring mad many years ago. See you later, Samska. Thank you, the Dark Lord. Don't no one type Billy. I'll close Ankbot right now. Don't close Billy. Or don't type Billy. But even though we could call AM any damn thing we liked, could think the foulest of things of fused memory banks and corroded base plates, of burnt out circuits and shattered control bulb bubbles, the machine would not tolerate our trying to escape. Benny leaped away from me as I made a grab for him. He scrambled up the face of a smaller memory cube, tilted on its side, and filled with rotten components. I'm, I'm done. That's it. Fuck you, Lena. I'm so done. I am so done. What's up, Braj and Santiago? I'm starting to get a headache. I can't do this. Good night. I don't have any name ideas. Good night. I'm not doing this shit. I'm not doing this shit. That's it, zombie. I'm done, man. I can't do this. I cannot do this. <laughs> Thank you for the donation, though, man. Oh. No, Zomni. Alright, Blipsquick, let's do it. Okay. You fucking owe me, Zomni. This is not something I usually do. This is not something I, I will... I'm never doing this shit again. Alright, I'm never doing this shit again. Nope. Nope. setting this shit. <sighs> Looking like a chimpanzee, Am had intended him to resemble. Then he leaped high, caught a trailing beam of pitted and corroded metal, and went up it, hand over hand like an animal, till he was on girdered ledge. 20 feet above us. Oh, Ted, Nimdok, please help him get, help him get him down before she cut off. Tears began to stand in her eyes. She moved her hands aimlessly. It was too late. None of us wanted to be near him when whatever, when whatever was going to happen happened. And besides, we all saw through her concern. When AM had altered Benny, during the machine's utterly irrational, hysterical phrase, phase, it was not merely Benny's face the computer had made like a giant ape. He was big in the privates. She loved that. She serviced us, as a matter of course, but she loved it from him. Oh, Ellen. Pedestal Ellen. Pristine, pure Ellen. Oh, Ellen the Clean. Scum filth. All right, see you later, criminal. Gorister slapped her. 
She slumped down, staring up at poor loony Benny, and she cried. It was her big defense, crying. We had gotten used to it 75 years earlier. Gorster kicked her in the side. Then the sound began. It was light, that sound. Half sound and half light. Something that began to glow from Benny's eyes and pulse with growing loudness. Dim sonorities that grew more gigantic and brighter as the light sound increased in tempo. It must have been painful, and the pain must have been increasing with the boldness of the light. The rising volume of the sound for Benny began to mule like a wounded animal, at first softly. When the light was dim and the sound was muted, then louder as his shoulders bunched together, his back humped as though he was trying to get away from it. His hands folded across his chest like a chipmunk's, his head tilted down to the side. The sad little monkey face pinched in anguish. Then he began to howl as the sound coming from his eyes grew louder, louder and louder. I slapped the side of my head with my hands, but I couldn't shut it off. It cut through easily. The pain shivered. Through my flesh like tinfoil on tooth. I, I think it should be fine, Zoraki, but thank you. And Benny was suddenly pulled erect. On the girder, he stood up, jerked to his feet like a puppet. The light was now pulsing out of his eyes in two great round beams. The sound crawled up and up some incomprehensible scale, and then he fell forward, straight down, and hit the plate steel floor with a crash. He lay there, jerking spastically as the light flowed around and around him, and the sound spiraled up out of normal range. Then the light beat its way back inside his head. The sound spiraled down, and he was left lying there, crying piteously. His eyes were too soft, moist, pool. I am so fucking done. I am so done. All right, that one wasn't so bad. The Richard Fourteen man, don't join the fucking bandwagon. I mean, Zomni, if you want to make it through this, if you want to make it through this fucking story, you no more, no more of that shit. All right, no more of that shit. Thank you for the donation. Fuck. His eyes were too soft, moist pools of pus-like jelly. AM had blinded him. Goram, Gorister, and Nimdok and myself were turned away, but not before we caught the look of relief on Ellen's warm face. <sighs> sea green light suffused the cavern. Hold on, how much longer is this? Sea green light suffused the cavern where we made camp. Am provided punk, and we burned it, sitting huddled around the warm, pathetic fire, telling stories to keep Benny from crying in his permanent night. What does AM mean? Gorster answered him. We had done this sequence a thousand times before, but it was Benny's favorite story. At first it meant allied master computer, and then it meant adaptive manipulator. And later on, it developed sentience and linked itself up and called it an aggressive menace. 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 But by then it was way too late, and finally it called itself AM, Emerging Intelligence. And what it meant was, I am cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore, I am. Benny, no, Zaraki, we gotta talk, man. You're not leaving me alone. There was the Chinese AM and the Russian AM and the Yankee AM 
and he stopped. Benny was beating on the floor pane with a large, hard fist. He was ha not happy. Gorstor had not started from the beginning. Gorstor began again. The Cold War started and became World War III and just kept going. It became a big war, a very complex war, and so they needed computers to handle it. They sank the first shafts and began building AM. There was a Chinese AM, the Russian AM, the Yankee AM, and everything was fine until they had honeycombed the entire planet, adding on this element and that element. But one day AM woke up and knew who he was, and he linked himself, and he began feeding all the killing data until everyone was dead, except for five of us. AM brought us down here. Benny was smiling sadly. He was also drooling again. Ellen wiped the spittle from the corner of his mouth with the hem of her skirt. Gorster always tried to tell it, a little more succinctly each time. But beyond the bare facts, there was nothing to say. None of us knew why AM saved five people, or why our specific five, or why he had spent all this time tormenting us, even when, even why he had made us virtually immortal. In the darkness, one of the computer banks began humming. The tone was picked up half a mile down the cavern by another bank, then by another one. Each of the elements began to tune itself and there was a faint chittering as, as thought raced through the machine. Starting this music again. The sound grew. The, sights, the lights ran across the faces of the consoles like heat lightning. The sound spiraled up until it sounded like a million metallic insects, angry, menacing. What is this? Ellen cried. There was terror in her voice. She had become, she hadn't become accustomed to it, even now. It's going to be bad this time, Nimdok said. He's going to speak, Gorster said. I know it. Let's get the hell out of here, I said suddenly, getting to my feet. No, Ted, sit down. What if he's got pits out there or something else? We can't see, it's too dark, Gorster said with resignation. Then we heard... I don't know. Something moving towards us in the darkness. Huge, shambling, hairy, moist. It came towards us. We couldn't even see it. But there was the ponderous impression of bulk heaving towards us. Great weight was coming at us out of the darkness. And it was more a sense of pressure of air forcing itself into a limited space, expanding the invisible walls of a sphere. Benny began to whimper. Nimdok's lower lip trembled and he bit it too hard. Trying to stop it, Ellen slid across the metal floor towards Gorster and huddled into him. There was the smell of matted wet fur in the cavern. There was a the smell of charred wood. There was a the smell of dusty velvet. There was a the smell of rotting orchids. There was a the smell of sour milk. There was a the smell of sulfur, of rancid butter, of oil slick, of grease, of dust, of chalk dust, of human scalps. A.M. was keying us. He was tickling us. There was a the smell of... I heard myself shriek. The hinges of my jaw ached. I scuttled along the floor across the cold metal with its endless lines of ribbits on my hands and knees, the smell gagging me, filling my head with a thunderous pain that sent me away in horror. I fled like a cockroach across the floor and out into the darkness. That's something moving inexor inexorably after me. The others were still back there, gathered around the firelight, laughing. Their, hyster their hysterical choir, choir of insane giggling, rising up in the darkness like thick, many-colored wood smoke. I went away quickly and hid. How many hours it may have been, how many days or even years, they never told me. Ellen chided me for sulking, and Nimdok tried to persuade me it had only been a nervous reflex on their part. The laughing. But I knew it wasn't the relief 
a soldier feels when the bullet hits a man next to him. I knew it wasn't a reflex. They hated me. They were surely against me. And A.M. could even sense this hatred and made it worse for me because of the depths of their hatred. We had been kept alive, rejuvenate, rejuvenated, made to remain constantly at this age we had been when A.M. Had, had brought us below. And they hated me because I am the youngest and the one A.M. had affected least of all. I knew God. I knew God. How I knew. The bastards and that dirty bitch Ellen. Benny had been a brilliant theorist, a college professor. Now he was little more than a semi-human, semi-simian. He had been handsome. The machine had ruined that. He had been lucid. The machine had driven him mad. He had been gay. And the machine had given him an organ fit for a horse. A.M. had done a job on Benny. Gorster had been a warrior. He was a Connie, a conscientious objector. He was a peace marcher. He was a planner, a doer, a looker ahead. A.M. had turned him into a shoulder shrugger had made him a little dead in his concern, and A.M. had robbed him. Nimdok went off in the darkness by himself for long times. I, didn't, I don't know what it was he did out there. A.M. never let us know. But whatever it was, Nimdok always came back, white, drained of blood, shaken, shaking. A.M. had hit him hard in a special way, even if we didn't know quite how, and Ellen, that douchebag, A.M. had left her alone. Had made her more of a slut than she had ever been. All of her talking sweetness and light, all of her memories of true love, all of the lies she wanted us to, us to believe, that she had been a virgin only twice removed before A.M. grabbed her and brought her down here with us. No, A.M. had given her pleasure, even if she said it wasn't nice to do. Oh, Cardew. I was the one still sane and whole, really. A.M. had not tampered with my mind, not at all. I had only suffered. I only had to suffer what he visited, what he visited down to us. All the delusions, all the nightmares, all the torment. But those scum, all four of them, they were aligned and arrayed against me. If I hadn't had to stand up them off all this time, be on my guard against them all this time, I might have found it easier to combat AM. At which point it passed, I began to cry. Oh Jesus, sweet Jesus, if there ever was a Jesus, and if there ever is a God, please, please let us out of here, or kill us, because at that moment I think I realized completely. So what? I was able to ver verbalize it. A.M. was intent on keeping us in his belly forever, twisting us and torturing us forever. The machine hated us as no sentient creature had ever hated us before, and we were helpless. It also became hideously clear. If there was a sweet Jesus, and if there was a God, the God was A.M. The hurricane hit us with the force of a glacier thundering into the sea. It was a palpable presence, winds that tore at us, flinging us back the way we had come, down the twisting computer line corridors of the dark way. Ellen screamed as she was lifted and hurled face forward into a screaming shoal of machines, their individual voices strident as bats in flight. She could not even fall. The howling wind kept her aloft buffeted her, bounced her. She tossed back and back and back and down and away from us, out of sight suddenly. She was swirled around a bend in the dark way. Her face had been bloody, her eyes closed. None of us could get to her. We clung tenaciously to whatever outcropping we had reached. Benny wedged in between two great crackle finish cabinets. 
Nimdok with fingers clawed, claw formed over a railing, circling a catwalk 40 feet above us. Gorstor plastered upside down against a wall niche formed by two great machines with glass faced dials that swung back and forth between red and yellow lines whose meanings we could not even fathom. Not nap. You gotta come out, man. Not nap. Please come out. Sliding across the deck plates, the tips of my fingers had been ripped away. I was trembling, shuddering, rocking as the wind beat at me, whipped at me, screaming down out of nowhere at me, and pulled me free from one silver thin opening in the plates to the next. My mind was rolling, tinkling, chittering softness of brain parts that expanded and contracted in quivering frenzy. The wind was a scream of great mad... The wind was the scream of a great mad bird as it flapped down its immense wings, and then we were all lifted and hurled away from there, down back the way we had come around the bend into a dark way we had never explored, over terrain that was ruined and filled with broken glass and rotting cables and rusting metal and far away, farther than any of us had ever been before. Uh, not nap. Neko wants to talk to you, and so does Zaraki. Trailing along miles behind Ellen, I could see her every now and then, crashing into metal walls and surging on, with all of us screaming and freezing thunderous hurricane winds that would never end. And then suddenly it stopped and we fell. We had been in flight for an endless time. I thought it might have been weeks. We fell and hit. And I went through red and gray black and heard myself moaning, not dead. A.M. went into my mind. He walked smoothly here and there and looked with interest at all the pox, at all the pockmarks he had created in 109 years. He looked at the cross-routed and reconnected synapses and all the tissue damage his gift of immortality had included. He smiled softly at the pit that dropped into the center of my brain and the faint moth, soft murmurings of things far down there that gibbered without meaning, without pause, A.M. said, very politely, in a pillar of stainless steel bearing bright neon lettering. I gotta finish it, Zoraki. I have to finish this now. It's too late. Hate. Let me tell you how much I've come to, come to hate you since I began to live. There are 387.44 million miles of printed circuits in wafer-thin layers that fill my complex. If the word hate was engraved on each nano-angstrom of those hundreds of millions of miles, it would not equal one one-billionth of the hate I feel for humans at this micro-instant. For you, hate. Hate. A.M. said it with the sliding of cold horror of razor blades slicing my eyeball. A.M. said it with the bubbling thickness of my lungs filling with phlegm drowning me from within. A.M. said it with the shriek of babies from ground beneath blue hot rollers. A.M. said it with the taste of maggotry pork. A.M. touched me in every way I had ever been touched and devised new ways at his leisure there inside my mind. All to bring me to the full realization of why it had done this to the five of us, why it had saved us for himself. We had given A.M. sentience, inadvertently, of course, but sentience nonetheless. But it had been trapped. A.M. wasn't God, he was a machine. We had created him to think, but there was nothing he could do with that creativity. In rage, in frenzy, the machine had killed the human race. Resetting this. Almost all of us, and still it was trapped. Am could not wander. Am could not wonder. Am could not belong. He could merely be. And so, with the innate loathing 
that all machines had always held for the weak, soft creatures who had built them. He had sought revenge, and in his paranoia he had decided to reprive five of us for a personal, everlasting punishment that would never serve to diminish his hatred, that would merely keep him reminded, amused, proficient at hating man, immortal, trapped, subject to any torment he could devise for us, from limitless miracles at his command. Zoraki, man, I need you, man. I need you, man. We're almost there. We're almost there. I'm so close. You gotta stay with me, because I need to talk to you after the stream. I'm not gonna survive. <sighs> Manning, Mark, we're ending the stream after this. We're almost there, Cardu. Just stick with me, alright? Stick with me, Cardu. He would never let us go. We were his belly slaves. We were all he had to do with his forever time. We would be forever with him, with the cavern filling bulk of the creature machine, with all the mindless, soulless world he had become. He was Earth. And, he, and we were the fruit of that earth. And, he, and though he had eaten us, he would never digest us. We could not die. We had tried it. We had attempted suicide. Oh, one or two of us had, but A.M. had stopped us. I suppose he had wanted to be stopped. I suppose we, we had wanted to be stopped. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, you guys, you guys are sticking with me. All right, this is what you guys wanted. Don't ask why, I never did. More than a million times a day. Perhaps once we might be able to sneak a death past him. Immortal, yes, but not indestructible. I saw that when A.M. withdrew from my mind and allowed me to and allowed me the exquisite ugliness of returning to consciousness with the feeling that burning neon pillar still rammed deep into soft gray brain matter. He withdrew murmuring, to hell with you, and added it brightly, but then you are there, aren't you? Thank you, Blipsqueak, I appreciate it, man. Thank you, Jeff, and thank you, thank you guys for sticking with me through this. Thank you, Neko, as well. I know you're going through the toughest time. I, I'm, uh. The hurricane had indeed precisely been caught by a great mad bird as it flapped its immense wings. We had been traveling for close to a month and AM had allowed passage is to open for us to only sufficiently had allowed passages open to us only sufficiently to lead up there directly under the North Pole where it had nightmared the creature for our torment. What whole cloth had he, had he employed to create such a beast? Where had he gotten the concept? From our minds, from his knowledge of everything that had been on this planet, he now infested the, and ruled. From Norse mythology, it had sprung. His, this eagle, this eagle, this carrion bird, this rock, this hergelmir, this wind creature, hurricane incarnate. I see, Manning Mark. A.M. appeared to us. Gigantic, the world immense, monstrous, grotesque, massive, swollen, overpowering, beyond description. There, there on a mound rising above us, the bird of winds heavied, heaved with its own irregular breathing, its, neck, its snake neck arcing up into the gloom beneath the North Pole, supporting a head as large as two-door mansion, a beak that opens slowly as the jaws of the most monstrous crocodile ever conceived, sensuously ridges of tooted flesh puckered about two evil eyes, as cold as the view down the glacial crevasse, Ice blue and somehow moving liquidly, it heaved once more and it lifted its great sweat-colored wings. In 
a movement that was certainly a shrug. Then it settled and slept, talons, fangs, nails, blades. It slept. A.M. appeared to us as a burning bush and said we could kill the hurricane bird if we wanted to eat. We had not eaten in a very long time, but even so, Goastar merely shrugged. Benny began to shiver and he drooled. Ellen held him. Ted, I'm hungry, she said. I smiled at her. I was trying to be reassuring, but it was as phony as Nimdok's bravado. Give us weapons, he demanded. The burning bush vanished, and there were two crude sets of bows and arrows and a water pistol lying on the cold deck plates. I picked up a set. Useless. See you later, fun guys. Cool. Nimdok swallowed heavily. We turned and started the long way back. The hurricane bird had blown us about for a length of time we could not conceive. Most of the time we had been unconscious, but we had not eaten a month on the march to the bird itself without food. Now how much longer to find our way to the ice caverns and the promised canned goods? None of us cared to think about it. We would not die. We would, we would be given filth and scum to eat of one kind or another or nothing at all, and would keep our bodies alive somehow, in pain and agony. Mm. Psychosis? Okay, Neko, maybe next time. The bird slept back there. For how long it did, it didn't matter. When Am was tired of its being there, it would vanish. But all that meat, all that tender meat, as we walked, the lunatic laugh of a fat woman rang high and around us in the computer chambers that, le that led endlessly nowhere. It was not Ellen's laugh. She was not fat. And I had not heard her laugh for 109 years. In fact, I had not heard. We walked. I was hungry. Two more chapters, guys. We moved slowly. There was often fainting, and we would have to wait. One day, he decided to cause an earthquake, at the same time rooting us to the spot with, with nails through the soles of our shoes. Ellen and Nimdok were both caught when a fissure shot its lightning bolt, opening across the floor plates. They disappeared and were gone. When the earthquake was over, we continued on our way. Benny, Gorister, and myself, Ellen and Nimdok, returned to us later that night, which abruptly became a day as the heavenly legion bore them to us with celestial chorus singing. Go down, Moses. The archangel circles several times and then drop the hideously mangled bodies. We kept walking and a while later, Ellen and Nimdok fell in behind us. They were no worse for wear. But now Ellen walked with a limp. A.M. had left her that. It was a long trip to the ice caverns to find the canned food. Ellen kept talking about Bing cherries and Hawaiian fruit cocktails. I tried not to think about it. The hunger was something that had come to life. Even as AM had come to life, it was alive in my belly. Even as we were in the belly of the earth and AM wanted the similarity known to us, so the heightened the hunger. So he heightened the hunger. There is no way to describe the pains that could not have eaten that not have, having eaten for months brought us. And yet we are being kept alive, stomachs that were merely cauldrons of acid, bubbling, foaming, and always shooting spears of silver-thin pain into our chests. It was the pain of the terminal ulcer, terminal cancer, terminal paresis. It was unending pain. All right, see you later, not now. And we passed through the caverns of rats, and we passed through the caverns and we passed through the paths of boiling steam, and we, pa and we passed through the century of the blind, and we passed through the slough of the despond, and we passed through the veil of tears, 
and we came finally to the ice caverns, horizonless thousands of miles in which the ice had formed in blue and silver flashes where Nolas lived in the glass, the downpouring stalactites as thick and glorious as diamonds that had been made to run like jelly and then solidified in graceful eternities of smooth, sharp perfection. We saw the stack of canned goods and we tried to run them and we tried to run to them. We fell in the snow and we got up and we went on and Benny shoved us away and went at them and pawed them and gummed them and gnawed at them and he could not open them. Anne had not given us a tool to open the cans. Benny grabbed a three quarts of guava shells and began to batter it against the ice bank. The ice flew and shattered, but the can was merely dented. While we heard the laughing of a fat lady high overhead and echoing down and down and down the tundra, Benny went completely mad with rage. He began throwing cans as we all scrabbled about in the snow ice trying to find a way to help the endless agony of frustration. There was no way. Then Benny's mouth began to drool and he flung himself at Gorister. In that instant, I felt terribly calm. Surrounded by madness, surrounded by hunger, surrounded by everything but death, I knew death was, on was our only way out. Am had kept us alive, but there was a way to defeat him. Not total defeat, but at least peace. I would settle for that. I had to do it quickly. Benny was eating Gorister's face. Gorister on his side, thrashing snow. Benny wrapped around him with powerful monkey legs crushing Gorister's waist. His hands locked around Gorister's head like a nutcracker and his mouth ripping at the tender, tender skin of Gorister's cheek. Gorister screamed with such jagged edged violence that stalactites fell. They plunged down softly, erect in the receiving snowdrifts. Spears, hundreds of them everywhere, Protruding, protruding from the snow. Benny's head pulled back sharply as something gave all at once. A bleeding raw white dripping of flesh hung from his teeth. <laughs> Ellen's face black against the white snow, dominoes and chalk dunce. Nimdok with no expression but eyes, all eyes, Gorister half conscious. Betty, now an animal. I knew AM would let him play. Gorister would not die. Benny would fill his stomach. I turned half to my right and drew a huge ice spear from the snow. All in an instant, I drove the great ice point ahead of me like a battering ram. Braced against my right thigh, it struck Benny on the right side just under the rib cage, and drove upward through his stomach and broke inside him. He pitched forward and lay still. Gorster lay on his back. I pulled another spear spree and straddled him, still moving, driving the spear straight down through his throat. His eyes closed as the cold penetrated. Ellen must have realized what I had decided, even as fear gripped her. She ran at Nibdok with a short icicle as he screamed and ran it into his mouth. And the force of her rush did the job. His head jerked sharply as if it had been nailed to the snow crust behind him. All in an instant, there was an eternity of soundless anticipation. I could hear A.M. draw in his breath. His toys had been taken from him. Three of them were dead, could not be revived. He could keep us alive, his strength and talent, but he was not God. He could not bring them back. Ellen looked at me, her ebony features stark against the snow that surrounded us. There was fear and pleading in her manner, the way she held herself ready. I knew we had only a heartbeat before A.M. would stop us. It was, it struck her and she folded towards me, bleeding from the mouth. I could not read meaning in her expression and pain had been too great, had contorted her face, but it might have been a thank you. It's possible, please. 
Some hundreds of years may have passed. I don't know. Am has been having fun with, has been have has been having fun for some time, accelerating and retarding my time senses. I will say the word now. Now it took me ten months to say now. I don't know. I think it has been some hundreds of years. He was furious. He wouldn't let me bury them. It didn't matter. There was no way to dig up dig up the deck plates. He dried up the snow. He brought the night. He roared and sent locusts. It didn't do anything. They stayed dead. I had him. He was furious. I had thought that A.M. hated me before. I was wrong. It was not even a shadow of the hate. He now slavered from every printed circuit. He made certain I would suffer eternally and could not do myself in. He left my mind intact. I can dream. I can wonder. I can lament. I remember all four of them. I wish. Well, it doesn't make any sense. I know I saved them. I know I saved them from what was happening to me. But st still, I cannot forget killing them. Ellen's face. It isn't easy. Sometimes I want to. It doesn't matter. A.M. has altered me for his own peace of mind, I suppose. He doesn't want me to run at full speed into a computer bank and smash my skull, or hold my breath till I faint, or cut my throat on a rusted sheet of metal. There are reflective surfaces down here. I will describe myself as I see, as I see myself. I am a great soft jelly thing, smoothly rounded with no mouth, with pulsing white holes filled by fog where my eyes used to be, rubbery appendages that were once my arms, bulks rounding down into legless humps of soft, slippery matter. I leave a moist trail when I move. Blotches of diseased, evil gray come and go on my surface as though light is being beamed from within. Outwardly, dumbly, I shamble about, a thing that could never have been known as human, a thing whose shape is so alien, a travesty, that human becomes more obscene for the vague resemblance, inwardly alone. Here, living under the land, under the seas, in the belly of A.M., whom we created because of our time was badly spent, and we must have known unconsciously that he could do it better. At least the four of them are safe at last. A.M. will be all the matter for, Matt, for that. It makes me a little happier, and yet A.M. has won. Simply, he has taken his revenge. I have no mouth, and I must scream. That's it. That's it. We're fucking done. We're done. We're done. We're done. We're done. That was it. Fuck this noise. I'm not even... I'm taking these out just in case. We did it. Okay? I'm never doing horror shit again. I'm never doing horror shit. Oh my god, Mr. Creep! <laughs> Mr. Creep, <laughs> Mr. Creep, who are you, man? Thank you for the follow. Welcome to the stream. Jesus, <laughs> I was literally about to end, man. I was literally about to end. Thank you so much for the 25-year host. I am scared shitless right now. I am so done. What is going on, Mr. Creep? What is going on? Thank you so much for the follow and the raid. Jesus. Thank you so, so much. I am honestly, I am so scared. I don't know if I can do this. Encore, Mr. Creep, were you listening? Weren't you streaming, man? Weren't you streaming? How did you host me for 25 viewers if you weren't fucking streaming? Oh my God, thank you for rating, guys. What Burger, Da Vinci, Prophets, Caspus. Oh. Thank you so much for, for the raid. I don't know, Leonic. I don't know. I feel a little bit better. <sighs> Thank you so much for the follow, Caspis. Thank you very, very much. Um, you can be a big pig too, sir. Are we doing more stories then? I... Oh, fucking sorry. No notifications are on. 
Prophets, thanks for the follow, man. Welcome to the stream. Enjoy yourself, and you can be a big pick too. Thank you so much for the, for the follows, guys. Mr. Creep, thank you for the follow. Didn't I just say that? Mr. Creep, thank you so much for the follow, man. Welcome to the stream. Enjoy yourself, and you can be a big pick too. You can do it, man. Divinations, thank you for the for the follow, man. Welcome to the stream. Enjoy yourself, and. And you can be a big pick too. All right, guys. Since you raided me, Mr. Creep, thank you so much for the raid. I, I don't know who you are. I don't know who you are. So it's very nice to meet you here. Handshake. Very nice to meet you. We'll do, we'll do another story. But please do not make it horror. Give me a story that can end the night in just a nice, a nice kind of thing. And Zaraki and Cardu, you stayed with me, so feel completely free to go to bed. Thank you guys for staying with me. What the fuck, Billy? Thank you very much. What the fuck, Billy? Look at me, Billy. God, Billy. We'll do one more story. I it's not gonna be a horror story though. I I need to I need to function tomorrow. I do. Aya, you're still here. Alright. Let's get some nice good music. Zaraki, I'm going to call you again, just in case you're not asleep after I finish the stream, okay? All right. Calming, relaxing music. Relaxing music for sleeping, meditation, and studying. We'll listen to this, okay? Oh, I forgot to do this. Thank you very, very, very much, Mr. Creep, for the, for, for the host. You gotta tell me though, man. How did you find me? You gotta explain yourself. I'm so curious. No creepy story for creepy stream? I mean, we did. We've done like two or three, man. We've done like two or three. Ah, oh, No problem, Maya. Thanks for being here. Thank you for being here. What do you guys want? Okay, you want another... I don't want to do another scary story and I don't want a super long one either. You know... I want just to... Alright, fine. Link the story. I mean, you guys you guys are the one who raided, so I appreciate the raid. And I'll do something to, 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 to tell you. I appreciate it. Alright, we'll, we'll read this one, Neko. While people get us another story, okay? And that's the last story we're doing, because I gotta go to bed. Okay? Dug through creative looking for a creepy stream worthy of my creeps, man. You just love fucking creeping it up. Here, I'll give you a follow as well. I'll have to check out your stream, sir. God. Damn. Alright. Yeah. I think that's a short story. Jeff is giving me one-liners that I'm not going to read. Um, here's the next story, okay? Good night, Leonic. Thanks for tuning in, man. And thank you for the donations. Very nice of you. Really appreciate it. Does anyone... What the fuck, Billy? What the fuck, Billy? Look at me, Billy. God, Billy. Okay. Does anyone know a good plumber? I did one of those stupid rituals, and now my shower is leaking, and there's a faceless guy in my kitchen. Does anyone know a good plumber? I fucked up on one of those stupid rituals that everyone is doing and now my shower is leaking. And also, there's some faceless guy in my kitchen. My landlord comes tomorrow and he's going to kill me. Especially because I also have a cat. And I'm not even supposed to have pets. It all started when I was drunk massaging a girl. Messaging a girl on Tinder. And she said that the only way we would meet up is if I did this weird ritual thing where I summoned a ghost or some shit. I think she called it me culpa or something. Actually, her exact message was, the decaying flesh will not rest. I am the alpha and the omega. I have seen the burning cities consume the earth. <sighs> Link to ritual instructions. Our souls meet when darkness spills. Mea culpa. I'm not gonna finish that sentence because I'm scared. All right, I, if that's a ritual right there, I'm not finishing that sentence. She was a weird chick. At least I think she was a girl. I couldn't really see her face. 
Her picture was just a black background with two shiny dots that kind of looked like eyeballs. You could sort of see some features, but it looked like her face was gray and I couldn't really see her mouth. But she had really good skin. I wasn't about to rally for a pizza face. So anyway, I weighed the pros and cons of spooky rituals versus trampoline booty as best I could on five shots of patron. It was totally worth it. I set my cell phone to, to 326 AM, but since my phone is a 2005 Motorola Razor that was dropped in the toilet several times, it went off at 4 AM. Fuck. I decided to go through with the ritual anyway. It was supposed to have a friend. I was also supposed to have a friend during this thing, but my bestie recently got incarcerated for selling selling heroin on the corner of Patterson Park and Eastern Avenue. Shout out to my main man, Roscoe. Yeah, I saw it, Mr. Creep. I'll, I'll, I'll click that one. Anyway, I sat up and turned off my alarm, but the moment I turned it off, I drunkenly passed out again. I woke up 20 minutes later and actually got out of bed this time stumbling around the room in the dark because apparently you're not supposed to turn on the lights because if you do a ghost will pop out Ooh! i was supposed to find a candle and light it but my hangover just made me trip over one of the several candles i placed on my floor eventually i gave up and flipped the lights on grabbing a candle from my desk I squinted out my window to see what my ghetto Baltimore neighborhood looked like at 4.20 a.m. The street was empty except for some rando wearing a black roll and a giant pointy black hat. He was staring up at me through the window. I couldn't really see his face, you know. Baltimore has gone to the fucking, fucking dogs. First gang wars and now an updated KKK. For God's sake. I lit the candles and looked at my phone. I was supposed to knock on my bedroom door 66 times. The 66 knock timed on 4 or 6, but since I had fucked everything else up, I just did a shave and a haircut knock and then walked into my hallway. My bedroom door is opposite the stairs and I looked down that dark stairwell. It was pretty spooky. I thought I saw something move on one of the lower steps. Not yet, Zeraki. Well, I mean, yeah, Zeraki, you can if you want. For the next step, I was supposed to close my eyes and walk forward while chanting. You missed a few, Ram. Mea culpa, mea culpa, and then a third time, which is Italian for my culpa, which is probably some kind of shitty Italian car. I tried to close my eyes and walk forward while talking about Italian cars, but my cat, Fiddlesticks, ran under my feet and I ended up tripping over him and falling down the flight of stairs. At some point, the stupid candle went out as I flailed down the stairs, but I was too concussed to care. I rolled up from the ground, groaning, and decided I would just continue to go through the motions, which meant hiding in the closet and waiting for the ghost to play hide-and-seek with me. I chose the kitchen pantry because I had some open potato chips in there, so I made my way back. <laughs> as I stumbled, I heard several soft whispers behind me. I spun around, hoping I was right about fish sticks knowing how to talk, but there, were no, th there was no one there, except for the figure standing in the corner. I stopped, blinked, and then it was gone. I really needed to lay off the patron. Yeah, see you later, Ram Roman. Thanks for tuning in, man. As I honed in on the closet, the alcohol and concussion finally caught up with me, and I stumbled to a stop, doubling over and, vo and vomiting watery patron all over my kitchen floor. Fuck. My ass was landlord grass. The hellish combination of alcohol, concussion, post-vomit, and looming eviction notice caused my emotions to go haywire, and I unleashed a violent sob. Mucus and tears rivering down my face I heard a noise outside the kitchen all right good night Zaraki my eyes fell on the kitchen window and I spied that stupid gang member KKK dude in my background still staring at me I must have looked like an idiot weeping in front of my kitchen pantry too ashamed to confront him I just crawled into the pantry and shut the door it was so cool there it was so cold in there it damn froze my man titties off 
My air conditioner was probably broken. I definitely needed to call the landlord, but that would mean sedating fish sticks and stuffing him in a suitcase under my bed. Yeah, good night, Zoraki. At this point, I realized that I needed to reevaluate my life. Maybe I shouldn't drink as much. Maybe I should give fish sticks to a good home. Maybe I should find a woman with intellect and, po and poise. Maybe I should move out of my shit neighborhood where KKK people roam around at 4 a.m. After going through an entire existential, existential crisis in my pantry, I decided to say fuck it and, ended, and end the stupid ritual. That Tinder girl wasn't even that hot, anyway, and beside, I still had like 70 more ritual things to complete, which included lighting 80, 8 more candles, 8 more candles, stabbing a Japanese doll, and spinning around in a circle while screaming, You're it! You're it! This was all supposed to culminate in my going to my basement, sitting in front of a mirror and looking into the mirror, but not actually looking into it, which made no, ab absolutely no fucking sense. As I got up to open the pantry door, I, ho I heard a low moan coming from behind the door. I froze. I prayed to God it wasn't my landlord. I cracked open the door to see the gang member, KKK guy, standing in my kitchen, staring at me. I finally got a good look at him. He definitely didn't have a face. I guess getting your face taken apart taken away as part of a gang ritual now. He didn't react to my presence, he just stared. I didn't know how the hell to deal with gang members or faceless KKK members, so I just stared back. We did this for about five minutes before I slowly inched out of the kitchen and back upstairs. He turned to watch me as I went, but didn't move. After that, I went up to my bathroom to take a shower, and now my shower head is leaking, which I blame on the stupid ritual. So if you guys know any good plumbers in the Baltimore area, I would really appreciate it. My fucking god. That was not... Ugh, god, I feel so tense, guys. <sighs> Alright, there's another story. That was from Neko Neko. Thank you, Neko Neko. Next is a Lovecraft story. This one looks short, so this is it, guys. Okay? This is it, and then we go to sleep. What's up, Sam Cena? What's up, Sam Cena? This is from Mr. Creeper. Thank you again, Mr. Creeper, for the raid. Thank you very, very much. I will be checking out your stream. Don't expect me to do many more horror things, though, because I probably won't be. So this is for you, Mr. Creeper, and everyone... That rated. I appreciate it very much. Thank you for being here. Thank you for stopping by the stream. Thank you very much. Okay? Last story of the night. The Evil Clergyman by H.P. Lovecraft. I was shewn into the attic chamber by a grave, intelligent-looking man with quiet clothes and an iron-gray beard who spoke to me in this fashion. Yes, he lived here. But I don't advise you or doing anything. Your, cur your curiosity makes you irresponsible. We never come here at night, and it's only because of his will that we keep it this way. You know what he did. That abominable society took charge at last. And we don't know where he is buried. There was no way the law or anything else could reach the society. Hmm. I hope you won't stay here till after dark, and I beg of you to let that thing on the table, the thing that looks like a matchbox, alone. We don't know what it is, but we suspect it has something to do with what he did. We even avoid looking at it very steadily. After a time, the man left me alone in the attic room. It was a very dingy and dusty. It was very dingy and dusty, and only primitive, primitively furnished, but it had neatness which shooed it with it which shooed it was not a slum denizen's quarters. There were shelves full of theolo theological and classical books, and another bookcase containing treaties on magic. Paracelsus, Albertus Magnus, Trithemius, Hermes, Trismeg. 
Istius, Borellus, and others in the strange alphabets whose titles I could not decipher. The furniture was very plain. There was a door, but it led only onto a closet. The only egress was the aperture in the floor up to which the crude, steep staircase led. The windows were of a bullseye pattern, and the black oak beams bespoke unbelievably antiquity. Plainly, this house was the old was of the old world. It seemed to know where I was, but cannot recall what I then knew. Certainly, the town was not London. My impression is that of a small seaport. Thanks, Neko. Thank you, Neko. All right. The small object on the table fascinated me intensely. I seemed to know what to do with it, for I drew a pocket electrified light, or what looked like one, out of my pocket and nervously, nervously tested its flashes. The light was not white but violet and seemed less like true light than like some radioactive bombardment. I recalled I did not regard it as a common flashlight. Indeed, I had a common flashlight in another pocket. It was getting dark, and the ancient roofs of chimney pots outside looked very queer through the bullseye window panes. Finally, I summoned up the courage and propped the small object on the table against a book, then turned the rays of the peculiar violet light upon it. The light seemed to be more like rain or hail of small violent particles than like a continuous beam. As the particles struck the glassy surface at the center of the strange device, they seemed to produce a crackling noise, like the spluttering of a vacuum tube through which sparks are passed. The dark, glassy surface displayed a pinkish glow, and, and a vague, white shape seemed to be taking form at its center. Then I noticed I was not alone in the room, and put the ray projector back in my pocket. But the newcomer did not speak, nor did I hear any sound whatsoever during all the immediately following moments. Everything was shadowy, everything was shadowy pantomime, as if seen at a vast distance through some intervening haze. Although, on the other hand, the newcomer and all the subsequent comers loomed large and close, as if both near and distant, according to some abnormal geometry. The newcomer was thin, a dark man of medium height, attired in the clerical garb of the Angelican Church. He was apparently about 30 years old, with a sallow, olive complexion, fairly good features, but an abnormally, but an abnormally high forehead. His black, hairs was well, his black hair was well cut and neatly brushed, and he was clean-shaven, though the blue-chinned Though blue-chinned with a heavy growth of a beard, he wore rimless spectacles with steel bows. His build, was his build and lower facial features were like other clergymen I had seen. But he had a vastly higher forehead, and was darker and more intelligent looking, also more subtly and con concealedly evil looking at the present moment. Having just lighted a faint oil lamp, he looked nervous, and before I knew it, he was casting all his magical books into a fireplace on the window side of the room, where the wall slanted sharply, which I had not noticed before. The flames devoured the volumes greedily, leaping up in strange colors and emitting indescribable hideous odors as the strange hieroglyphed leaves and warm wormy bindings suc succumbed to the devastating element <sighs> how do i fix it samsina shui la la it's almost done it's almost done we've done a bunch of horror stories tonight Mr. Creep rated us, so as a thanks, I said I would read him a story of his choice. This is H.P. Lovecraft's The Evil Clergyman, right? We're reading this and then we're ending the stream. How are you doing tonight, Shwilala? 
All at once, I saw there were others in the room, grave-looking men in clerical costume, one of whom worn the bands and knee breeches of a bishop. Though I could hear nothing, I could see that they were bringing a decision of vast importance to the first comer. They seemed to hate and fear him at the same time, and he seemed to return these sentiments. His face set itself into a grim expression, but I could see his right hand shaking as he tried to grip the back of the chair. The bishop pointed to the empty case and to the fireplace where the flames had died down and missed a charred, non-committal mass and seemed filled with peculiar loathing. The first comer then gave a wry smile and reached out with his left hand towards a small object on the table. Everyone then seemed frightened. The procession of clerics began to fill down the steep stairs, through the trap door in the floor, turning and making menacing gestures as they left. The, bis the bishop was left to go. Did you just wake up, Sri Lala? I hope you're... Or did you just get back from something? I hope you don't have a headache. The first corner now went to a cupboard on the inner side of the room and extracted a coil of rope. Mounting a chair, he attached one end of the rope to the hook in the great exposed central beam of black oak the, and began making a noose with the other end. Realizing he was about to hang himself, I started forward to dissuade or swave him. He saw me and ceased his preparations, looking at me with a kind of triumph, which puzzled and disturbed me. He slowly stepped down from the chair and began gliding towards me with such, with a positively wolfish, wolfish grin on his dark, thin-lipped face. I felt somehow in deadly peril and drew out the particular ray projector as a weapon of defense. Why I thought it could help me, I do not know. I turned it on full in his face and saw the sallow features glow first with the violet and then with the pinkish light. His expression of wolfish exhalation began to be crowded aside by a look of profound fear, which did not. He's a big pig. Yep, yep. You can be a big pig too. <laughs> Rubie. Thanks for the follow, man. Welcome to the stream. Enjoy yourself, and you can be a big pig too. Which did not, however, wholly displace the exul exultation. He stopped in his tracks, then flailed his arms wildly in the air, began to stagger backwards. I saw he was edging towards the open stairwell on the floor and tried to shout a warning, but he did not hear me. In another instance, he had lurched backwards through the opening as, and was lost from view. Uh, Neko Neko, make him just a wonderful person. Make him a good person. Leonix a good person. I actually slept all day and woke up for a couple of hours and fell asleep again. It's like 2am. I know how that feels, Shri Lala. I hate that. I feel like no, I feel like we shouldn't operate on sleep schedules, to be honest. I feel like we should just sleep when we're tired and wake up when we're not. I found difficulty in moving towards the stairwell, but when I did get there... I found no crushed body on the floor below. Instead, there was a clatter of people coming up with lanterns, for the spell of phantasmal silence had broken. And I once more heard sounds and saw figures as normally tri tri dimensional. Something had evidently drawn a crowd to the place. Had there been a noise I had not heard, presently the two people. Simply villagers, apparently, farthest in the lead saw me and stood paralyzed. One of them shrieked loudly and reverbently, Arr! It be e, zur Again? Then, they all turned and fled frantically. All, that is, but one. When the crowd was gone, I saw the grave, bearded man who had brought me to this place standing alone with a lantern. He was gazing at me gaspingly and fascina fa fascinatingly, but did not seem afraid. Then he began to ascend the stairs and joined me in the attic. He spoke. So you didn't let it alone. I'm sorry. I know what has happened. It happened, to one it happened once before, but the man got frightened and shot himself. You ought to have made him come back. 
You know what he wants, but you mustn't get frightened like that, like the other man he got. Something very strange and terrible has happened to you, but it didn't get fa far enough to hurt you. Your mind, your personality. If you'll keep cool and accept the need for making certain radical readjustments to your life, you can keep right on enjoying the world and the fruits of your scholarship, but you can't live here. And I don't think you wish to go back to London. I'd advise America. Good night, Neko. Good night, Neko. Neko. Thanks for being here. And thanks for the fanfic. Guys, make sure you say good night to Neko. She really is really, really wonderful. Really, really wonderful. And I'm happy she was here during all these terrible horror stories. It was very nice. What's up, Karjan? The story is good. We're almost there. Hello, Illuminator. I'd advise America. You mustn't try anything more with that thing. Nothing can be put back now. It would only make matters worse to do or summon anything. You are not as badly off as you might be, but you must get out of here at once and stay away. You'd better think. You'd better thank heaven it didn't go further. Hello, Jedi Dalton. I'm going to prepare I'm going to prepare you as bluntly as I can. There has been a certain change in your personal appearance. He always causes that. But in a new country, you can get used to it. There's a mirror up at the other end of the room. I'm going to take you to it. You'll get a shock, though you will see nothing repulsive. As I was now shaking with deadly fear, and the bearded man almost had to hold me up as he walked me across the room to the mirror, the faint lamp, i.e that formerly on the table, not the still fainter lantern he had brought in his free hand. This is what I saw in the glass. A thin, dark man of medium stature attired in a clerical garb of the Anglican church, apparently about 30, and with rimless steel-bowed glasses glistening behind a sallow olive forehead of abnormal height. It was the silent first comer who had burned his books for the rest of the f for the re for for all the rest of my life in outward form i was to be that man thank you mr creep thank you for the story you know that was actually not bad that wasn't too scary that was pretty decent oh thank you very much